I'm Gene Peranak, host of MedTech Crossroads, and I am here with Dr. Philip Ola. Correct. Who is, uh, well, first of all, I gotta say, on the uh, steering committee of MedHealth, and yes. we're here at the MedHealth Summit at Ford Field, having a great time. So thanks for joining me here. No problem, thanks for the time. Yeah, and thanks for, for all your volunteer time that you've spent. And, and actually, you were in too. Yeah. instrumental in organizing a lot of the interviews that we did today, so yes, really yeah. appreciate that. No problem. Got Getting out great. there and get, just making everything happen. Yeah, it's been a busy day, but it's going well though. It's yeah. it going yeah. really well. And you are the CEO of Audacia Biosciences, which, Hello. this I love, a breath company. Yeah, we could say a breath research company. Breath yeah. research company. Oh, yes. Tell yes. us more about just what this means. What is breath so, research? So breath, um, it can be called XL breath research or uh, volatinomics or um, XL breath metabolism. But the concept is uh, when we exhale, there are thousands of particles that can come out from our mm. breath. But um, as time's gone on, what we've learned to do is to isolate some of those particles. And what we can do is we can... I won't say diagnose or screen, but you can identify patterns in people's breath. So recently we had a COVID breathalyzer that was approved mm. by the FDA. Uh, what they're doing is identify what are the key patterns that are that a person who is positive with COVID exhales, and then you use some artificial intelligence, and then you create a breath print mm. for that. Um, it's the same with TB. You can uh, distinguish between 17 different cancers using Excel breath. Wow. So the, the, the idea really is that breath is a very viable alternative for screening, for wellness and for disease screening mm. and for environmental monitoring. And what we're trying to do is look at new ways to analyze um, the compounds and particles in the air, but more on the side of how do we then present this information so that it becomes meaningful, so that it can, you can use it for behavior change, you can use it to automate the way the car should behave. Mm. So there's a lot of different applications that, um, that can come from analyzing breath. But it's a field that has really evolved over, over time and it's becoming more mature now because of the computational tools that we have to be able to analyze what is being exhaled and what's in the air. And I think most people, when they think of breath, first of all, it's like, wow, you can think about things with breath, and then they think of a breathalyzer, and they go, oh, yeah, alcohol testing. And then they hear the word car, and they go, oh, yeah, that's what you use breath for in, in cars is alcohol testing. But that's not the only thing you're looking at. No, that actually, to be honest, that's the one thing that we don't want to look at, at from the beginning because it's just, it is just so controversial mm. about, you know, um, Yes, you can detect drug usage and alcohol uses in the car with the next generation technology and it's ambient detection. So you don't need to blow into a device. And uh, now you know that that technology is coming down the line. A lot of people are worried that, well, if you implement this technology, then my car won't start. If there's mm. someone in the car that's had drugs or uh, that's had alcohols and there's a lot of concern. Uh, and on the flip side, um, people that are very conscious about drug and drink driving. They're saying if this technology exists, then nobody should be allowed to drive a car without going through the screening. Mm. So it is a very controversial um, topic. Now, the approach we're taking is we know that that exists and there's a lot of ethics um, around the, the ambient collection of breath. But what we're looking at is we're looking at it from a, a health, wellness, and screening point of view, early warning screening. What are the things that we can do in a car that actually helps the individual? Mm. So we're not trying to police anything. Uh, we're trying to look at what are the valuable applications mm. that we could do. But the first step for us is to develop and integrate the infrastructure into a car. Mm. And then we can then look at the values and the data coming back and then we can start exploring, okay, now what do you want to know? What do you want to do? What are the different applications um, that you can implement using this new system? Because you're basically building a platform technology at that point that you're able to deploy and it's going to have the ability to, I mean, we might think of like a, a spectrophotometer for certain substances where you, you're not limited to looking at one thing, I presume. Yes, so really it is a platform approach. So um, I think the first thing that we're going to deploy is going to be 
um, and in-cabin monitoring. Mm. So with the in-cabin monitoring, we want to look at um, we want to look at just general volatile compounds that are present. Uh, we want to look at things like your atmospheric uh, pressure, humidity, temperature, lighting, noise, uh, and then all the particle matters mm. that are deemed to be harmful to your health. So we just want to come up with a general profile of what is a really good comfort index for an individual who may have certain medical conditions? Oh, interesting. Because we want to personalize that, 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 that monitoring to individuals. But like you said, the initial variant of the solution is going to really just be collecting data. And then from that point on, we can look at, well, what do we want to monitor? Do we want, want to stress? Do we want to isolate what compounds um, a diabetic patient might be exhaling um, that um, when they have uncontrolled diabetes? Mm. Uh, do you want to isolate what are the conditions um, that cause a person to feel tired and possibly have an accident? So there's a lot of different things that, um, that you can do once you have the base infrastructure. Uh, and that's why it's important for us to kind of to explain that we're really just looking at base infrastructure. We're not monitoring your drugs, we're not monitoring your alcohol. We're putting in the base infrastructure so that we can then develop applications that are useful. Mm. For the person who's listening to this and says, wow, that's kind of cool. What are the kind of partners you're looking for? What, what sorts of entities would you like to connect with? So, as you move forward. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good point. Um, so we're definitely connecting with um, some of our healthcare partners mm -hmm. that are here at the, uh, at the, Med, at the Med Health, and uh, especially the, the, um, the, the partners that are exploring how they deliver care away from the hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, because really this one, we've talked a lot about value-based care, you know, of the different types. So. We're looking for partners that have uh, that are trying to monitor patients uh, and monitor conditions um, away from the hospital setting. Um, we're also really looking for the partners that are implementing autonomous vehicles and um, and putting in these advanced features um, like the camera systems and, and, and such into cars. Uh, because none of this really works if we don't have a, a partner in the automobile space. You know, we need an auto partner where we can. Um, implement the system and um, and then get the data back then another big piece is going to be um, the the users of the system by right? how we present this data um, is going to have a very important role in uh, how the system is used uh, right now with the base system that we're exploring it generates over a hundred parameters a second mm. right so when you think about the, the, how you take that data and you know do summarize something it. With it. Yeah, you got to do something really valuable. But we need the input from the drivers and input from uh, from patients and input from people that that uh, understand the ergonomics of a vehicle mm. to figure out where does that go? Does it go on the dash? Does it go? Th is it an audio si or an audible signal? Um, at what point do you trigger a signal? Yeah. So there's a lot of um, design features that need to be integrated with the the future designs of vehicles. So. Uh, we're definitely looking at partners from that space, and we're talking to some people to get an idea of, you know, what would be your um, your first project if we were to do this, and um, you'd be surprised at what they are. So, they, so they, there are some discussions going on with the automobile industry, but then it really ju it's just then the other key piece will be. Um, looking at the different groups mm. that have um, unique populations that have challenges driving, where this could be something that really um, makes that driving experience safer mm. for them and for everyone else on the road, mm. and also collects that important data that might be useful for their uh, for the patients later on. Mm. So that's really interesting, a, uh, a, a new company that is actually doing customer discovery. I tip my hat to you. <laughs> yeah, but we've learned along the way that if you don't, it comes back it to bite you. It comes back to bite you every yeah, single time. Big time, big time. Well, that's great. It's a, it's a, it's a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful thing there. What do you, I guess one last question there. From the standpoint of things like HIPAA and things like regulatory clearances, that's going to be obviously going to be a challenge. It may be something that's downstream a little ways, but what what thinking have you done in that in that yeah. area? So that's definitely downstream. Um, and the, the the one of the biggest challenges that um, that we're trying to face 
Um, it's, it's not actually sensor data, to be honest. It's not mm. what, they, what parameters to sense or what to do with it or how to link um, the, the data we're getting to health outcomes and to diseases. That should be, should be the hardest thing, but it's not. Mm. The hardest thing that we're facing is um, is the data? Is that how you display the data? How do you, you know, how do you protect people's data? Uh, how do you share that data? Who do you share it with? Uh, when you get data from the system, which, for example, one one scenario, one use case is pollution. So it monitors the pollution outside and the pollution inside. And when it gets to a point where it's dangerous what should happen, mm. right? Do you get mm. the car to lower the windows? Do you put it up, do you close the air? So there's a lot of issues that we have to think about with what to do with the data that's being generated. But to your point about HIPAA, that's another very serious consideration mm. that we have to, we have to make. Um, one solution that might work with this is de-identifying all the information, throwing it onto a blockchain, and then somehow having the blockchain and the healthcare systems interact so that you c they can get value from the data mm. that's being collected. But again, that's one of the, we've got, we got massive ethical issues to overcome. And then the personal health information issue is another big challenge that we have to overcome. Um, it, which is funny because you really would think the big challenges around this are the technology and the innovations, mm. but it's not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The implementation and how it fits into the into the world. Yes, that's the that's going to be the big challenge. But it, there's um, there's a lot of partnerships and discussions that need to happen, and um, and then we have we do have to change how we think about data and how we think about health data mm. and how we think about privacy, how we, how we can access our own data and choose to share our data. So there's a massive paradigm shift in, um, I think they're calling it the democratization of data is mm. what the, the, the term is. And I think that's one thing that we have to address with this model after we got through, that's downstream, we mm. still want to do this, and then downstream we'll really have to think about how we deal with that data aspect. Yeah, but to do the customer discovery, you've got to go out there and you've got to get the data and you've got to figure out what it means and, yes. and be able to have those discussions. That's correct, yeah. Well, that's absolutely. an exciting world there. Oh, thank Dr. you, Jim. Philip Ola, Dacia Biosciences. Thank we you for the thankful time. Thankful to have you here today, and thank you for all your help with the summit, obviously on the steering committee as well. We yeah, we really work hard with the steering committee, don't we? It's, oh, it's there you go. It's a lot of work, <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth it. Well, we appreciate having you here today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.